Mayor Suarez, no one in all of U.S. history has gone from being a mayor to commander in chief. Why are you up for that task? I love the challenge. Uh, and there's never been a Hispanic president either. So I think it's a, it's a double new. What we've seen in American politics in my lifetime is America often will choose an underdog. America likes to uh, do something different than what is expected. And so I think it's an opportunity for Republicans in particular to elect not just a mayor, which is a problem solver, a unifier, but also a Hispanic who could deliver not just a win in 24, but wins going forward. When you think about Hispanics in America, there's 60 million of them. And I'm the only candidate from either party that can connect directly with them in their own language. You're talking about 20% of them are undecided. I mean, just do the numbers. Yeah. When you look at the last presidential elections uh, that were decided by such a small margin. Um, it creates a tremendous opportunity for Republicans. Your job, your current job as the mayor of Miami has been described by some as just purely a ceremonial yeah. role. So how do you explain to voters that you actually have enough experience that you would be ready for this kind of job? Well, I would question that. The, the president's job, the governor's job, a mayor's job, an executive job is not just to run the company. I'm the CEO of a you know, billion and a half dollar company with 4,500 employees and four labor unions in a highly international city where I meet world leaders from this hemisphere and from across the world. The place that I run, uh, which by the way in the metropolitan area will be the 23rd largest state in America, uh, is, is an area where I've created the highest wage growth, the lowest unemployment, and the highest tech job growth. Our economy is evolving to an increasingly digital economy, and we have to have a president that understands that and can chart a path forward in that new economy. I want to ask you some questions about your state, your governor. Sure. Uh, he says that Florida is where woke goes to die. Do you agree with that? Does that help you in Miami? Look, in, in Miami, uh, and, and my philosophy is about building. I like creating. I like bringing people together. I was elected by 85% and re-elected by 80%. And I've created the most diverse, most innovative economy in America. That's what I like to do. I like to create high paying jobs. Uh, I don't like to do things that will push industry and jobs out. I think that's something that makes me different, that separates me. After the governor, governor DeSantis signed that uh, so-called don't say gay bill that changed what public school teachers could talk about in the classroom. You said you thought it was excessive. Could you be more specific, though? Sure. If that had come to your desk, would you have signed it? Yeah, there, there's two pieces to it. There was a piece uh, that had to do with teaching sexuality to, to young children, and I think that that, that, was, that that was fine. You know, as a parent, I don't want the public school system or, or any school system or the government teaching sexuality to young children. I think he extended it to high school children, mm -hmm. and I think that's where I think, you know, sexuality and the teaching of sexuality is important for young adults so that they can be responsible. And I think that's where you take a win, you take the win, but then don't go and, for example, get personal with Disney, you know, where you say you're going to put a, a jail next to Disney, take away their taxes and status, and then force Disney, which is the largest employer in your state, to decide that they're not going to reinvest in your state and kill thousands of jobs. That's the difference between uh, his philosophy and mine. So would you have not signed it? Oh, I would have signed the K through, through third grade bill. I would not have supported uh, an extension. I wouldn't have focused on I wouldn't have put my resources into that. And just in the last few days, you've um, started to speak out against the changes to some of the curriculum about U.S. history. Uh, there, you know, we saw the vice president come down to Florida. She called the changes in Florida outrageous, an insult to black Americans, the way that uh, the, the new standards for how teachers would have to talk about slavery. I know that you said you disagreed with that, but have you voiced those concerns locally? Have you voiced those concerns to Governor DeSantis that yeah. this is not something you think is right for your students? I've been very vocal, very clear about the fact that uh, there's no virtues to slavery that should be taught in our school system. And by the way, that's not a, a just Vice President uh, Kamala Harris position. Most candidates feel that what the governor should have done is said, look, we made a mistake. This should, we should not be sending this signal where we're extolling the virtues of slavery under any circumstance. It wasn't a leadership opportunity. Unfortunately, he didn't take it. I think it's part of his sort of never back down philosophy. You entered this race just days after former President Trump appeared in federal court in your city. Yeah. You saw those pictures. We all saw those pictures of, of sensitive government documents seeming to be strewn about in Mar-a-Lago. Does it bother you to think about government documents kept like that? No, what really bothers me, to be honest, is the fact that, you know, he had uh, classified documents. So did uh, the, the president, who was vice president at the time. So did the former vice president. I, I don't think it should get to that point. We shouldn't get to a place where we're raiding the former president's house, where we're 
uh, you know, we should be able to get those documents. In fact, those documents should never have left the White House to begin with. I don't even understand a policy. For example, if I were the president, all classified documents would be digital and you would have digital restricted access. And when you leave the White House, those digital assets stay in the White House. This should never happen in America with the digital assets we have. It should never have even gotten to this place. Well, prosecutors say that they asked for them back. And part of the problem was that they were asking, they subpoenaed, they didn't Look, get them back. I, I, I'm sure. And, and again, I'm not his lawyer. I, you know, he's uh, you know able to defend himself on all those issues. My issue is how does this affect the American people? And should we be talking about these issues or should we be focused on how do we create prosperity for the next generation of Americans and for the maximum amount of Americans? But I'm thinking about, you know, we saw that case in Miami. I'm thinking about the most recent charges, though. Um, you know, the, the special counsel alleging that that the former president knew he lost the election yeah. and still worked to try to overturn the election, uh, try, still worked to try to stay in power. I personally believe that there wasn't enough evidence that I saw that the, that the election should be overturned. Um, Having said that, I don't think that these kinds of prosecutions are viewed by people in my party uh, as something that is positive for the country. And I think that's something that we should think about. The fact that every time he's prosecuted, he surges in the polls, that should say something. Okay, I'm going to hard pivot. Cool. We're going to make it through a lot of policy questions here. Okay. What are the circumstances in which you would regulate AI? Well, AI, just like crypto and other generational technologies, has to be regulated so that A, it doesn't stifle innovation because we know that our competitors are also developing these technologies, but B, it pr protects consumers and it protects people. But we have to understand that China, Russia, North Korea, all these other countries, Iran, are also developing artificial intelligence technology and we cannot put ourselves at a disadvantage as we often do with regulation so that they're getting an advantage in military capabilities and in other abilities to attack our systems, to read our emails, uh, to uh, break our codes. I think that that's on people's minds. Another one that's definitely on people's minds here in Iowa is abortion. Absolutely. We saw the governor here sign a new abortion yeah. law. As president, how would you help the nation reach a consensus on that yeah. issue? Uh, what would you push for? Well, I'm pro-life personally, but I understand that uh, a consensus position is a federal 15-week minimum. That's what I've said. Uh, I believe that that's a place where we can rally the nation around. So for me, I think the, the right place for a federal minimum would be at 15 weeks, and I would sign that as president. Even if that takes away what some states... It wouldn't take away. What, it would just be a federal minimum. States are allowed under under current uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence to... To, to enact their own their own uh, uh, ban. Bans. So you would make sure that there was that at it the was at the federal level that there was a federal minimum of 15 weeks. You've, you've deviated from some of the other candidates on immigration. Uh, we started this interview and you talked about your uh, Hispanic roots. You talked about how you believe that that would bring new voters into the field. But I want to specifically about the border. Yeah. What would you do differently? Um, what would you do not only from this president, but what would you do different from the other Republicans in this race? Um, the current administration has has had essentially no border policy, and it's created a crisis where you have uh, not just a, 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 you know millions of people have come in that are undocumented, but you have a fentanyl crisis, you have a human trafficking crisis, that uh, you know cartels are making more money trafficking human beings than they are selling drugs. So I think you do have to treat the border as a crisis. The number of people that are dying out of a fentanyl overdoses is the equivalent of a 747 crashing every single day. So I think it does start with uh, potentially defunding the 87,000 IRS agents uh, that were funded and creating more resources for border security. But in addition to that, I think I'm the only candidate that's articulated a long-term strategy on how to solve immigration. And I think it has three more components. The first is right-sizing legal immigration, pegging it to objective metrics like unemployment, the need for skilled and unskilled labor, which, is, which are objective metrics, our declining birth rate, also an objective metric so that legal immigration can float in a way that we don't have to continually have this debate. Secondly, I think we have to depower China. We're giving China half a trillion dollars of our wealth on an annual basis. We've got a near shore and French shore, a lot of our supply chain, bring back that wealth. It doesn't cost us anything to do it. Labor in Mexico, for example, is the equivalent of what it is in China. So there isn't a benefit of having it there. And China's an adversary that's using those resources to subvert us in our own hemisphere. So you mean helping bring more jobs to south of the border? Helping bring more jobs to our hemisphere which of course is in, in the U.S., but also south of our border. I see what you're saying. You know, you have 80% of our microchips being uh, developed in Taiwan, right? That's a, that is an incredible vulnerability to the United States. 
Instead, we can be developing some of this technology here. We're doing some of it in Arizona and Ohio, but we have to be developing more in our hemisphere so we can create prosperity so that people in our hemisphere don't want to necessarily, don't need, feel the need to come illegally into our country. And then number three, as a Hispanic Republican president, I think I'd be in a unique position to emphasize the kinds of, uh, the kinds of um, deals that need to be made for those who are undocumented in this country to determine what kind of status they should be given um, in, in terms of, of not having a two-tiered system where we have people that are working on W-2s that are competing against people that are working either on 1099s or getting paid under the table. Okay, the last topic I want to bring up with you is the climate change. Americans are feeling the effects right now. It's hot, it's hot. today, but in Florida, I mean, we saw these record temperatures sure. in the ocean. Scientists frantically trying to save coral that was dying off. We were talking about priorities. What would yeah. be priority on day one in the White House? It is a priority. Would it be a priority to try to tackle climate change? And how do you do that? So I think we have to start talking about it in a more healthy way. We have this sort of binary discussion about either you, you, you support the economy or you support the environment. In Miami, we like to say that the environment is the economy, right? We can't separate one from the other. Uh, hurricanes are not Republican or Democrat, right? We have to prepare for them. And as a mayor, you don't have the, 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 you don't have the luxury of blaming someone else. Mm -hmm. So we've spent you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on resiliency because we know that the more we spend on the front end, the less we spend in disaster relief on the back end. So we've made targeted investments. Uh, and, and I think that we can support a sustainability economy as long as it doesn't come at the detriment of our current economy. And I think that evolution is happening. You're seeing it not just in the United States, you're seeing it across the world. You're seeing it here in Iowa where you have um, carbon capture of, of ethanol that's that's produced in, in this uh, area. So there's a tremendous amount where of... Where you have wind. Over half the I, energy in Iowa is You have wind. Energy. And Florida, you have solar. Um, the Florida Power and Light is the largest purveyor of solar in the country. Do you think that limiting... Reduction of fossil fuels is a, should be more of a, I mean, more of a priority from all politicians. You said hurricanes is not, yeah. but the hurricanes aren't political. So often these conversations feel red and blue. Yeah, they do feel red and blue. That's absolutely right. But I, I don't think we should put artificial constraints that hurt the economy either. And I think that's where some of it has gone astray on the Democratic side. I also think on the Democratic side, it's become a social policy engineering mechanism with the Green New Deal and things mm. like that. I don't support that. What I support is coherent, sound economic energy policy that will help us transition to a renewable energy future, but do it over time so it doesn't hurt the American public. Well, I really appreciate you taking so much time Thanks. for doing all I this. We covered a lot of ground. We did, and I'm so, glad for this conversation. Thank it's, you. it's the conversation we should be having in America. Thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.